Isn't it time that we have a national conversation as a country? The economy is tanking, taxes are rising, things are going down the tubes. All we can hear is all about political peccadillos and chicanery. It is time that we had a conversation in this country. It is time that we declutter and have a real conversation. And this is Siasa Bomba. I am Dibala. <laughs> Once more, welcome to Siasa Bomba. Remember, you can use the hashtag Siasa Bomba. I am Dibala Nair, and I'm really excited on this first installment of Siasa Bomba, where today we are focusing, as I mentioned, Earlier, the role of governors in devolved Kenya. Is it a private fiefdom or servant leadership? So first of the mic, I'll just want to introduce our panelists who will be engaging us throughout the conversation. And I have the great pleasure of hosting Kevin Osido. He is an accomplished governance specialist who serves as executive director of County Governors Watch, that is CGW. This is an NGO whose purpose is to provide solutions for socio-economic and political development in the counties of Kenya by educating and building the capacity of citizens and county government officers. We also have with us Honorable Majala Mlagui. Uh, she is the elected deputy governor of the county government of Taita Taveta, one of the 47 regional governments in Kenya. Majala first entered the political scene during the national elections in 2017 when she ran on a platform based on young development-focused leadership and youth and women's empowerment. Prior to entering politics, Majala ran a social impact company that empowered rural artisanal miners in East Africa by helping them create sustainable livelihoods through responsible mining, ethical sourcing, and access to fair trade markets. Majala also provided consulting services on extractive governance and policy issues related to artisanal and small-scale mining to development and governmental agencies. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Siasa Bomba. Thank you. Asante sana. So I'm really stoked that you've joined us on this first installment. And uh, this is just to highlight and see, hacking back to when devolution was shaken into place, how have we fared on so far? And I'll begin with you, Kevin, just... Uh, First off the mark, by asking you one simple question, nine years down the line, would you held the governor's role in uh, mainstreaming devolution, a resounding success? Um, the ball, moderately successful. Moderately? Moderately successful. Because if you look at uh, one of the reasons why Kenyans opted for a devolved system of governance was to move closer. Mm -hmm rather move uh, power closer to the people. And this power was meant to ensure that uh, their voices are made to count and that they are also able to make key decisions in the resource uh, management and uh, sharing. And that is not what we are seeing today. And uh, if you look at the total amounts of monies that the national government has taken back to the people through mm -hmm. national treasury, we are talking of about 2.34 trillion Kenya shillings. Mm -hmm. And if this is money that is supposed to be changing the people's lives, Honestly, Kenyans should have expected much more better from our uh, governance and from our governance uh, system. And so that's why I rank our, devol our devolution and particularly the performance of governors as moderately uh, successful. I wonder if um, Lagu will be holding the same view. Moderately successful, you know, the deputy governor, of course, maybe you'll want to say, <laughs> oh, a resounding success. Um, we're still in the toddler stage, I would say, of devolution. And I would say that we've done more than moderately, um, being moderately, moderately successful. Um, some of the gains that we have noted in very far-flung areas of Kenya would not have been achieved if we still had centralized government. Some of the matters that we're seeing that citizens are engaging with their governorships, including members of parliament and members of county assembly, are happening because government is now closer to the people. Mm -hmm. So we're more than moderately successful. We're more than, um, we're seeing the fruits of devolution to a point mm -hmm. where the economies are growing more than they were before when government was centralized. We're seeing people 
people more empowered on the ground. We're seeing more projects in terms of health, roads, um, school infrastructure being adequately catered for. So it, it, I wouldn't say that we're there yet. We're still seven years into devolution. Mm -hmm. um, we've had 56 years of independence. Um, slightly more than that. So we're not at the point where we can say that this is going to be a resounding success, but definitely what we're seeing on the ground is miles, 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 miles more than we've seen over the last 50 or so years. So I wonder, Kevin, or uh, you with the County Governor's Watch, of course, you've been uh, gallivanting about trying to <laughs> see what the 47 counties are doing so far. What, what is your assessment generally? Uh, the problem, my assessment in so far as performance of our counties is... Um, as, as uh, Mwishimua rightfully says, we have made certain strides. But if you are to look at what the expectation of the citizens were, I think we expected much more than what we've been able to see. And of course, uh, what we have experienced, or ex what we have, uh, the milestones that we have made have, have faced certain challenges. And one of those challenges has been delayed disbursement of resources from national government to county governments. But that is really not supposed to be an excuse because we've also seen uh, county governments and governors gallivanting around, uh, you know, failures of uh, national treasury to be able to give them enough resources. But if you look at what our counties can be able to, uh, you know, uh, bring out in so far as our own source revenue is concerned, we don't see governors putting a lot of emphasis in what they can be able to generate from within their own counties. They are waiting for national government to give them resources, whereas the constitution and other supporting, uh, supportive legislation, such as the Public Finance Management Act, yes. Urban Areas and Cities Act, mm -hmm. has, have given them that power and authority to be able to ensure that their counties are actually building up heavy investments to be able to plow back resources into the counties. You talk about uh, what national government has been able to do, and we are focusing on young people, for instance. If you go to almost all the, uh, let me say, half of the counties, or rather three quarters of them, so we talk about uh, 34 counties, Look at the state of youth unemployment. We have young people coming back to Nairobi, whereas devolution was meant to be, you know, getting the, pop the, the bulk of young people out of Nairobi into the counties. And this is purely because governors and counties have failed, in my view, to ensure that young people have opportunities mm -hmm. to secure an, an, uh, employment and to be seen to be generating uh, you know, revenues into the counties. So if you look at uh, how our, our counties have performed in terms of expanding employment, uh, the, the employment bracket for the youth is quite wanting. Of course, there are policy issues which also borrow or border around things to do with the uh, schedule for functions because youth is not a devolved function but is partly devolved because a lot of what governments are doing is supposed to respond to young people's benefits. And so these are concerns that from the eye of the citizens and from what we are seeing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as county governance uh, watch, we expect that counties are supposed to be expanding spaces and opportunities for employment, which then is supposed to ensure that people are raising money and then that that money is getting plowed back into the counties through taxes, through you know, and, and I, I several want others. To interfere right there. Just um, we can't say that we started devolution in 2013. We got our constitution in 2010, and we expect that we have a full-blown successful story right from the beginning. You yourself understand that when devolution was envisioned within the constitution in 2010, there were certain frameworks that needed to be put in place. Once we had our elections in 2013, then we had a team of people who are now coming in to see how do we implement exactly what was um, listed out in Schedule 4, all of the functions that are transitioning. This is why we had the transition authority. This is why we had a lot of training happening for all of the officers that were coming into government trying to see how do we put flesh on this structure, the skeleton that has been created by the Constitution. Now, if we were truly to be successful, as you're saying, that we want to see counties, counties expanding, then what I would have expected is that all of the Schedule 4 functions that are devolved would not exist at the national government level. Health would be at the county. Mm -hmm. Ministry of Livestock, Agriculture, Irrigation would all be at the county because these are devolved functions. Road functions, transport would be at the county. But what we're finding is that we're getting 15% of the national budget, yet expected to perform 35 to 50% of the functions as per the Constitution. And when, we look, when we look about the own source, yeah. when we look at own source revenue, I will give you an example of Taita Taveta. When before 
the 2013 elections, we had county councils that were able to generate revenue, maybe around the 100 to maybe 250 million mark. As a county government, we receive, together with conditional grants, maybe about 5 billion a year. Out of that, we have 350 million, which we've been able to generate as a government of on-source revenue. 350 million out of 5 billion. So when we're saying that the county governments need to be generating their own source revenues to be able to expand these functions, then I think we're a bit deluded because most of the money still re is retained at national level and not even just at the ministry level. We have development agencies. You have, for example, the Coast Development um, Waterworks Agency. We yeah. have um, Kera. We have Kura. All of them holding monies that should be essentially channeled to the counties to ex make those expansive um, investments that you're talking about. Youth may not be a devolved function, but it is integrated across yeah, all of the right, functions extreme. that we're talking I, I'm about. I'm sorry to interrupt, just to ask you one simple question as well, because is it a matter of uh, ingenuity and creativity from the county level on how to generate revenue or the disbursement of these funds? Because we're talking two different uh, kettle of fish here. It's both. It, you know, it's both. It's both. Yeah, but from, from, from the aspect of generating your own revenue, because we have a county like Laikipia, and I think the governor has actually uh, mooted the idea that, yeah, we should go to, you know, the infrastructure bonding and, uh, you know, s s try and source funds from the capital markets as it were. That is a good, you know, model of generating revenue for a county. And I wonder which other counties have floated such an idea. And this is what the creativity we are asking. Uh, instead of solely depending on the national government, where we can see services and resources, they're stonewalled and people are complaining at the county level. Why can't you come up with your own creativity uh, and ingenuity to have sources of revenue, right? Just mm. you hold on to that. Let me just come back to Kevin yeah. because you wanted to interject a bit. I hope uh, you've and, not and lost your track. No, 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 I haven't because uh, Moishimua mentioned something that really keeps bothering me when I talk about interact with county governments. Yes. And this is the failure to fully devolve functions. And you see she's mentioning water, she's mentioning uh, issues to do with health, uh, partly even education has, has issues. Agriculture, we have over 74 parastatals that are supposed to be fully devolved but are being held by national government. So you're on Why? the same page with her? We are the same page, okay. but, but <laughs> we, we, no, 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 we are the same page, but that is fully on the failure of governors. Because if governors through their own institution, say the Council of Governors, can push, because when, the, we, when uh, we introduced uh, devolution in 2013, and she mentioned the transition authority, the transition authority, which was chaired by Kinudia Wamwangi, came yes. up with a good report, which was meant to ensure that functions that are supposed to be devolved are fully devolved. Eight years down the line, why haven't we devolved these functions, and yet we are seeing resources that are supposed to be going to the counties still being managed by national governments. Health is a serious issue, and we are talking COVID-19, for instance, and counties are threatening to close down. And if you look at how national government has systematically cabalized governors to be able to agree into even signing agreements, which in my view is not supposed to be the case, because when you com make commitments, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and forget about your responsibility as a governor to be able to ensure services are delivered and then use the excuse that functions are not devolved. It is for you to engage with your county assemblies to ensure that you have effective rules and regulations, so legal frameworks that are going to be ensuring that the functions are devolved are being properly executed, which in my view, I do not think that uh, governors have effectively done. So I remember that today we are talking about governors and some of them, for those who are elected in the second term, are 13 months of their, of their terms. What does that therefore mean for sustainability of counties? The value you talk about on source revenue, in my view, counties have more than 110 revenue streams. Governors have only concentrated on one. And every time we see them, uh, you know, um, working with TV stations to share on, uh, you know, um, um, taxes. Yeah, yeah, taxes and, and all that. Yet there are over 110 streams which governors are supposed to be ensuring that they work around with their county assemblies to, to put in place laws so that people are not uh, taxed 
you know, you, you move from Nairobi, for example, to like Kipia you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Why should a vehicle be taxed at every entry point of a county? That should not be happening. You go to the Mamambogas, we have county officers who are always working with papers, asking them for 20 shillings, 40 shillings, 100 shillings. Why should the Mamambogas be stressed to be paying to a county government that in my view sometimes has not even made it possible for them to access markets? So that we have services that are being delivered and, and, and people are also feeling that the resources which they are giving back to the counties are working to the, are rather working for them. Fish farmers along the lake region, we have 13 uh, counties in the lake region. Why haven't they come up to be able to put together a fish facility, you know? Why should fish move from Kisumu to Thika for processing? That money is being mined at Thika. Why can't governors around the lake region consider it having a manufacturing facility for fish farmers to ensure See, on I, social I, yes. I think <laughs> right there you're being contradictory, my, my brother. Um, when we're talking about on-source revenues, we, of course we're going to be talking about taxes. We're not talking about government getting into business. So you've kind of split it in between when you're talking about the fish farmers and setting up a manufacturing facility. Mm -hmm. There will be taxes coming through, through business permit, for example, through movement of cargo maybe, um, through small areas, maybe the fish farmers coming from the lake to the manufacturing facility. But in terms of the large-scale revenue that is coming in, it would be going straight to the pockets of the people, not to the county government. Which is not purposes, happening, because that money is being collected. For purposes, yeah. for purposes of administration. So we have to be very clear about what we're discussing here of what own source revenue is. Which it is, is not, not businesses. It is taxation to the population within that particular area. Now, you've just complained about mamambogas being taxed by people walking around on the road. Mm -hmm. You've just complained about... I'm not complaining. I am presenting... But, but, but the question is, uh, Majala, <laughs> is taxation the only source of revenue? It is not. It is not the only source of revenue. Fantastic. It is one of is the one. sources. Yes. However, when we're talking about own source revenue, how does a county government um, generate or mobilize that revenue? It is either through taxation. It is either through those bonds that you're talking about. If you live in an area that has the market potential, it is either through development grants and development partners coming in and supporting you or any other investment capacity, for example. So when we're talking about a com a county government's but grants, revenue. Grants are not sources of revenue. They are sources of revenue. When we're talking about World Bank giving 101 million uh, Kenya shillings for banana plant investment within the county, right. we count it as our own our revenue, Fantastic. not own source revenue. Exactly. All right. It so is a source talking, of revenue, so but not own source about, revenue. So when we're talking about <laughs> own source revenue, is then money that is generated taxation. by the county exactly. government, not through from World taxes. Bank. But you can't through tax taxes. a grant, Moshimiwa. You can't when tax World a, Bank no, builds no, no. water, we, listen, we've asked you can't go. So you're yeah. mixing the issues because she's saying you that is just one source of the taxes. Yeah, the grant of the revenue, not own source revenue, but of the revenue. Can I? If we're going I make to it be clear. specific about Jabal. what own source Let revenue is, if we're going to be clear about what own source revenue is, it is what we're able to generate through, as you said, the laws, policies of the county. Not necessarily these other matters Thank that you. are coming through the development mm -hmm. grants, but these other items are revenue for the county. All right. Now, you cannot say so, that we cannot tax Mamamboga, but at the same time you're sitting doing nothing, not getting what, taxation. What I'm saying is that Mamamboga is not feeling the tax which the county is taking from her. Or, That's or, a separate conversation. But that is really the essence so of... So feeling is, uh, you know, the requisite resources exactly. and the services that why, is why, coming from why the county should, is not available. Yes, is not, is not, not just available, is not commensurate. Okay. Because, for instance, a county government cannot pass laws for milk dairy farmers to be taxed for the milk which they are, uh, which they are producing but the roads that are supposed to be leading from the farm to the market are not done. It is not the responsibility of the dairy farmers to repair the roads. That's very correct. That's right. It is the responsibility of the government. Yes. So when the farmer is being taxed, I don't want to see my taxes mm -hmm. paying people's salaries. The taxes are supposed to be for service delivery, which is what we are seeing today, which is why I said counties have failed to ensure that they raise their own resources to be able to plow back for service delivery. Instead, the little resources, and I said there are 110 sources of revenue, Thank you. rather, uh, for on source revenue for counties. For sources of, of revenue, I mean for revenue sources, we have about three of them equitable share, 
that comes from national government, that is taxed. We have grants. For example, she mentioned World Bank. You cannot tax World Bank money because that money is money which is coming in for specific facilities. If a county like Taita Taveta says we don't have water and World Bank says we are going to ensure that the citizens of uh, Mugumbeni, for example, have water, you cannot now begin asking them to pay because World Bank will ask you, we are doing it for the sake of the citizens. And then you have an uh, equalization fund that goes now to uh, other counties that are incapacitated, Fantastic. you know? Right. I want us just to, you know, also wind up on the funding and the taxes as well, just the resources that we're talking about. But the existential argument has been that not all counties are endowed the same. So we cannot say that the resources can be equally distributed from all the counties because different counties have different yeah. resources. They have been, I mean, endowed differently. That is the argument that is on, on the ground. That's why you have the equalization fund right. as it is right now. But you've been pushing this particular narrative uh, as far as we are not endowed, you know, resourcefully, so we cannot be compared to other counties in terms of, you know, progress, in terms of development. Your remarks. Um, we have to understand again that from, from independence to where we stand at the point of devolution, um, there was a lot of money centralized and the development that we saw in this far-flung counties yes. didn't happen the same way that we saw in, for example, neighboring counties of Nairobi, in the Kirinyagas, the Nyeris, the um, Nakurus, the... The, there's a circumference that you can look at from Nairobi going out. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're talking about marginalized counties or counties that would require the equalization fund, yes. most of them are resource rich. Mm -hmm. we, we cannot de um, deny that. They have plenty of minerals. They have plenty of tourism um, opportunities. They mm -hmm. have plenty of farming potential. They could be our agricultural baskets. But all of these opportunities require investment and not just government investment, private sector investment. So when we say that these counties are still struggling, they've not been able to be opened up. For example, we've come in into a county that is 17,000 square kilometers. Most of that is park area, 62% of it is park area. None of the revenue that is coming from the park comes into the county for purposes of expanding, for example, the road infrastructure, mm -hmm. for expanding um, the health facilities, for expanding the water distribution across the county. So we would then, of course, rely on national government to provide us with that equitable share disbursement to be able to make those investments to then attract people like yourselves to say, Debal, we have an area within the Savo where you can build your lodge mm. and your lodge will then be able to employ, let's say, 50 p youth and this youth are the same ones who are then going to expand the economy of the county. So there has to be a sense of what are we talking of investment in terms of the national government all the way down to the county government that would then help us harness these opportunities. One of the opportunities that we've looked at from the agricultural perspective in the coastal region, for example, is large-scale agriculture. Mm -hmm. And that is something that needed to be pumped in a lot of money for the one million acres, for example, in Tana River, to be successful. But again, you find that aside from the lack of support to the county governments for this kind of projects, there's a lot of corruption that is happening. We can't get away from that. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot of resources are getting lost uh, for the benefit of the Monainchi because of corruption. Now, we have to ask ourselves both from the county perspective and the national government perspective. What are we doing as part of consequences when these funds get lost? Because then we get into co conversations where we're being told counties are failing, mm -hmm. but we don't have the resources. When we look at the equalization um, perspective, for example, um, the law hasn't gone through. Some of these formulas that are being utilized to say that this is how resources will be distributed across the supposedly marginalized counties, um, is, it's very contentious. So in our county where we can very clearly see that the poverty levels are below the 50% or whatever levels are in, in the rest of the country, we're being told we're not necessarily a marginalized county. So is it that the animals um, are the ones that are benefiting more? Is it the <laughs> land that is benefiting more? Or is it the population that is there that okay. requires to be supported through all of these funds that are from Fantastic. the national level? Uh, yeah, allow me to just butt in and hear from Kevin so that we could actually wind up on that particular sure. issue yeah. of resources or revenue uh, generation from the counties. Your, your take. One of the things that I think uh, Moishimiwa is not bringing out clearly 
is the functional role of the county government, particularly when it comes to intergovernmental relations, because we have a law that protects what Moshimewa is talking about. How is uh, Taita Taveta County, for example, a county that almost three quarters is a national park, supposed to engage with the national government to ensure that its opportunities and potential are uh, exploited? Remember that national parks are national government functions. But we cannot run away from the fact that if, if uh, Taita Taveta, as an example, considers an effective engagement with the national government to find a clear cut or a cross cutting mainstreamed uh, co shared responsibility between the government and the, the county government and the national government through the national park, there has to be a win win. What the county governments have failed to a do is... The point is Narok as well. Exactly, yeah. because of Masai Mara, mm -hmm. you know. And, and the, we have all many, many of those kind of examples. And that is an issue, the ball, that boils down to on-source revenue. Because if the county, these county governments can consider an effective engagement with the national government, the resources, for example, that tourists pay at the parks, if we can agree that the county governments and the national government have a conversation where the locals benefit from what the foreigners bring into the county, other than those resources being uh, foiled back to national government treasury for national duty or national functions. In my view, we can find a, a, um, a solution to those kind of issues. And that is where, for me, I consider a failure for county governments, particularly governors, to think outside the box. How do I boost? what I am getting from national government through whatever fund, whether it's, it's equalization or equitable share or grants that come from Friends of Kenya, mm -hmm. what else can we be able to do? Because this country is endowed with immense capacity. The opportunities are innumerable. Mm -hmm. But what the governors have failed to do is to think progressively out of the expectations of sit that citizens had for them. Because it would be an excuse, in my view, for what, for instance, Mwishimiwa is saying, assuming that you are in a rally somewhere in Voi, yes. and you are telling them the tourists are bringing money that goes back to national government because the national park is a national government function. That, in my view, would be an excuse. Let's find an opportunity to engage with the national government through the Intergovernmental uh, uh, Relations and Technical Committee and the committees within the Council of Governors because we cannot continue to have these excuses where local resources are being channeled back to counties, yet uh, we have frameworks, legal frameworks that are supposed to help us respond to some of these, uh, uh, some Even of these some questions. Even some of the disbursement that is coming from the National Treasury, at times we find uh, you know, the whole lot of money, billions, going back to the National Treasury. It's not supposed they, they, to be. It has not been utilized by the counties. Okay, and then the stock excuse is like, oh, this money was debased uh, late, we could not uh, actually you know, implement uh, some of the project we wanted to do because of, of, of time constraints. So uh, the let coming of the disbursement also has been a niggling worry. And I think, uh, yeah, thorn in the flesh for the, for, for, for the counties. So there, are two, there are two things that I need to correct here. Please. And Dibal, I'm so actually surprised that you've said that. No money is returned to the National Treasury. Whether it has been disbursed but later. From the Auditor's um, General's book, if it you does, count, it, yeah, it, it, yeah, the they've always been saying, oh, this particular tidy sum of money went back to the National Treasury if, because it has not been utilized. If all of us can remember level. our basic accounting, for any year where you've not utilized your funds, it will then carry forward to the next year. And this is what we then budgeted for. We budget for, and if you look at all of the county government um, financial statements, you will note that they will have a figure. If monies haven't been fully disbursed in one financial year, they will have a figure that will have been brought forward from the previous year. So the money is not returned. The money actually is able to be utilized by the county governments. Whether it actually comes in on time, that is an argument that we've all had as county governments okay. to say, we need to be able to, you want us to be able to provide health services. You want us to be able to provide water to the citizens, but you're not giving us the money to pay the suppliers to be able to carry out the services. How do we move forward? So that, that is a challenge. But one thing that I feel my, uh, my brother here is very stuck on failure. 
<laughs> is stating that we have not done what is required to engage with national government yeah. um, to enable us to get the resources that are required for certain functions. So if I specifically look at the tourism sector, we as a county government have engaged with not only the ministry, we've gone all the way to the president, to State House, to try and figure out what is the best way of bringing back the resources that are generated from the Savo East and Savo West National Park to be managed, as you said, either co-shared or some form of agreement done between Taita County Government and the Ministry of Wildlife and Tourism. Yeah. That has not, the discussions there have not necessarily borne any fruit, partly because of reluctance of national government in engaging with us. So my question to you would be, what is the failure of the current um, cabinet secretaries and principal secretaries engaging with governors and deputy governors and county assemblies within that matter? We've looked at what possibilities exist for our, our county to be able to get the resources in other manners other than the Intergovernmental Relations Committee that we're talking about. How do we degazette a national park and make it a game reserve? You've mentioned NAROC. NAROC is able to actualize the potential of Mar the Mara because it's a game reserve. It's not a national park. So how do we start comparing those situations so that Taita Taveta can then be able to access the, the funds that are coming in from there? But in, a, in addition or aside to all of those legislative um, issues, we're also looking at how do we engage with all of the businesses that are established within the park to then create, to ensure that job opportunities are going to our youth, mm. to ensure that local content is actually um, catered for for our local businesses, then they shouldn't be getting their tomatoes and um, lettuce and the rest from Nairobi. That should be coming from the county itself. So those are the type of innovative programs that we're thinking about to empower our people, but that's not going to bring in revenue to the county government. That's going to bring in revenue to the pockets of the local Monainchi. Thank you. One specific, one, thank you, thank one you. specific <laughs> example. I, I, I know we can go <laughs> one, hours and nine on this particular. One, this, this, I don't even think last, one, last, last one, last one, last one, last one, last one, one specific example, specifically yeah. on mining. You have a law that has uh, been enacted in 2016, very specifically saying that revenues from the mineral industry need to be split 70% national government, 20% counties, 10% 10, 10 um, local communities. Over 1 billion Kenya shillings, probably even more than that, three, four times more than that, has been um, paid to the national government through treasury. Thank you. None of that money has Thank come you. to counties I, or communities. I have to step and in. it is not for <laughs> I have to step in. I, I want to <laughs> give you time to rejoin because All yes, right. we are actually pinched for time and no we need problem. to cover a lot uh, of stuff that we have ahead of us. So let, let's talk about, first of all, uh, governors as steamrollers of ethnicity because this is an accusation that has been raised, nepotism and cronism. And uh, we have a statement here from uh, Kogi Wamwere who is noting that, quote unquote, to avoid the tragedy of this distorted devolution, the constitution should not have allowed negative ethnicity to be the ideology of devolution to the detriment of nationalism and should not have conceived devolution that would degenerate into Majimbo. He notes that, uh, uh, yes, there's a lot of ethnicity and nepotism that is happening currently, uh, distorted devolution. Do you really fly with this particular argument? Maybe it will be apropos to ask you, <laughs> because you'll say no. <laughs> I would say no, of course not. <laughs> um, I think we also devolution as an avenue of access to opportunities for all of our ethnic tribes. Um, and we have to agree that Kenyans, to some extent, have embraced negative ethnicity in some aspects of life that are detrimental to all of us. So it's not a matter of devolution, it is part of our national ethos and values. What do we hold dear to us? Why is it that some tribes may be valued more than others? Why is it that some seem to get more opportunities than others? When devolution came in, we hoped that, that um, would help address some of the challenges of accessing job opportunities and um, business opportunities even for the local communities who seem to have been marginalized at that particular point. When you are 0.1% of the population and you're surrounded by 40% of the population who seem to then also hold maybe 80% of the wealth, you have to find ways of pushing.
And maybe this is why we're starting to see a bit of that negative ethnicity being... But from your assessment, do you think it has an entrenched ethnicity? Because we can have a case in point of uh, um, more university. Remember when there was that particular mm -hmm. towing and throwing of who should be the vice chancellor, Lab and Nairo shouldn't, shouldn't be the vice chancellor because it's not from, from that particular area. And we had the governor coming to the fore and saying, yeah, we, we need our man to be the person who's heading this particular you know, uh, university. That is just a good case in point right now. Nepotism, we talk about also currently what we have uh, in Makweni, where mm. people are raising eyebrows. Why do we have the chief health officer, uh, the chief health officer, you know, yeah. uh, related to the <coughs> governor being in that particular position? So where do we draw a, a, a demarcation line? Yeah, you could be qualified still, have good papers, but you're related to the governor. It's definitely, devolution has definitely raised um, or put a spotlight on some of these issues. I can't say whether it's right or wrong in terms of should you not be related to the governor or not or the deputy governor or not, because in some places it's a very small population. You have counties where there the are only 177,000 of them. The chances of relations are going to be high. But where maybe we need to be looking at the negative ethnicity is why is it that as Kenyans, we're unable to say that we can be led by whoever is in that particular place? If I decided to run for governorship in Isiolo, would I be accepted? Probably not, because I'm not from that particular area. And those conversations are what we need to have as a country. All right. Debal, yep. we actually have, uh, when we had uh, devolution coming in, the National Cohesion and Integration Commission issued uh, guidelines on how counties are supposed to undertake human resource responsibilities. And the guidelines were that uh, you do a 70 30 percent, mm -hmm. so that you have 70 percent exactly. yeah, from those who are locals, and then 30 percent from those who are outsiders. True be it, Kenyans. The way in which, uh, and Moshimo has rightfully said it, the, our politics is largely ethnic. And uh, what governors and anybody who is elected in office will do is to identify those who are very, you know, instrumental towards uh, my being elected as a, as a person. But remember that that is not the expectation of what Kenyans had when they voted for a new constitution that then gave us counties. Our expectation was that we will be looking at performance, and this performance is supposed to be equated to service delivery, so that it doesn't matter who is in that office as long as services are delivered. If I come from Rarieda, for example, the chief officer health or water should not be from my village for me to be able to access, uh, to access water. However, the first generation governors are the ones who actually uh, moved this mm -hmm. to be able to more or less install it and we saw instances where, in fact, some governors were saying, we cannot build your roads because you never voted for us. You didn't vote for me, so I don't care whether you have good roads or not. Yes. Whereas, really, it's not supposed to be like that. Um, in addition to that is also the manner in which we, we, we undertake the narrative around performance. Does it mean that uh, for counties where we do not have professional skills, and this therefore goes back to largely uh, the northern frontier counties, or so mm -hmm. those counties within the FCDC, where even finding a doctor is such a big struggle because of the perennial marginalization, discrimination that they have had to go through. We had a case in point, for example, in Marsabit, where they had to advertise and keep advertising for an internal auditor, and they were unable to get an auditor until and this is factual, uh, the governor had to ask somebody to recommend, you know, um, for professional skills. So we have those kind of very lean and lean mm -hmm. occurrences within our devolved system, but that is also largely because of failure of governors to identify capacity. Failure of governors to what identify is your, capacity. What is your gap, or rather capacity gap, and then how do you ensure that you have capacity building mechanisms, working with other institutions, Kenya School of Government, for example, you have the Marifa Center, the Council of Governors, to be able to build the capacity so that we don't have ethnicity as an excuse Thank you. to lock out people from either accessing opportunities or be, being seen to be playing a critical role in service delivery. Right. Okay, let me just also get uh, this conversation uh, around deeper and ask uh, the relationship between, you know, the governors and, um, you know, the county assembly, the MCAs. And, of course, we know the drama that has been happening so far. Hacking back 
2014 when it began in Makuweni, uh, where we had a stalemate to the point where actually uh, there, there was a statement of dissolution that the, the, the president should, you know, dissolve this particular uh, county as it were. And for me, I wondered because it came to the table of the county uh, of governance and they were hailing, you know, that statement of dissolution instead of <laughs> actually fighting it, right? But before we even head there, just give me and paint that particular picture of a relationship between the MCAs and the governors. I know for you, as you'll say it's cool. Yeah, but generally, <laughs> just looking around, yeah. <laughs> for now, I would say it's good because we also got to a point where we were almost dissolving our yeah. county government. So we've had that experience of very acrimonious relationships yes, between yes, yes. the executive and the assembly. Um, and in an ideal world, you want to have an executive that is able to plan, is able to budget, is able to then execute whatever plans that it has put into place with the support and oversight of the assembly and with the support of the assembly in terms of legislative matters mm -hmm. and any um, public participation and representation roles that they should be um, enacting together with the citizens. What you find is that a lot of interests come into play. It's politics, so there's always going to be a lot of interests that are conflicting. It's good you mentioned politics. That, do you think then also they're, they're being politically weaponized? Th yes, that's yes. All, that, but that's always going to happen. I mean, we're living in a political world. We got into this seat through a political process. Mm. So the, the, the likelihood of certain processes being politicized is extremely high. And we're still in a place where we're in the teething stages of understanding who needs to be doing what and who needs to be addressing what matters within what particular process in a manner that will be rational, fair, and hopefully neutral. We're nowhere near there mm -hmm. just you. yet. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, did you find it a bit <laughs> consternating that, yes, we had the Council of Governors, yeah. even the Senators, that are actually, you know, vouching for the dissolution of uh, the county government of Makweni? Until now, the President had to put up a task force to see if the, the reasons that were being projected, they actually hold water for, for them to dissolve this particular county. So for me, I wondered, were they really custodians, first of all, as the Senators? Of this particular to give uh, a good um, advice to, yeah. to to the president and even the council of governors why do we have it in the first place if critical matters of dissolution will come to the table and still they will say dissolve this particular county um one of the things that happened with mcqueen which is actually um, a case point of dissolution of counties is politics because, uh, and, and uh, in addition to your surprises, is the fact that even the governor himself also supported that uh, particular dissolution. And we had because a conversation. Things are not really working. Exactly. Yeah. We had a conversation with uh, His Excellency Kivutha Kibwana, and he said, Yes, I am for this dissolution. Why? Because if you are a governor who is in a county where the relationships between your assembly and your office are uh, acrimonious, you cannot uh, do anything, laws cannot be passed because by constitution, the county assembly support exe uh, the executive by ensuring that laws are passed, bills are put in place, and, and uh, you know, before the governor sends to them. So if the county assembly says, we do not do that, you cannot run your county. If the assembly says, we can't pass your, bu your budgets as a county government, there is nothing that will happen. So as a governor, when you get to the level where you realize that you, your hands are tied, you basically dissolve because your constitution actually allows for dissolution of counties and anybody can ask the president as long as your issues are uh, clear and they relate to uh, the requirements of a dissolution of the, uh, of the, of the county government yes. and you go to the Senate and the senators have their discussions and it is clear. However, one of the challenges that I feel is, uh, is a great concern to devolution is what responds to the question you asked about the relations between the government, the governors and county assemblies. In my view, the bar, I have the imagination that, that uh, these relationships are transactional other than transformational. <laughs> they are transactional because county assembly members will ask for what's in it for me. Well, if I pass... Exactly, it's politics, it's interest. Exactly, it's so, politics yeah. and it's interest against the bare minimum of the citizens' uh, expectations, services to be delivered. So if you assembly members say we need uh, X amounts of millions in our bank accounts before we pass your budgets, and this is what we truly see in almost all the counties, including the county in the city called Nairobi, where every time we have challenges with the budget being passed, right now as we speak, the clerk is, is away, we have an acting clerk, 
purely because of inability of the governors to meet the expectations, which are selfish interests, you know, related to, to money matters. Number two is failure of us to undertake a clear audit of performance of county assemblies. So you had 2013, 2017, how many laws did the county assembly pass to be able to enhance performance of the executive? If the laws do not go beyond 15, you are not doing very well, yeah? Between 2017 and uh, right now we're headed to 2022, the next, uh, the end of the second term of the county uh, integrated development planning. If the counties are not supporting the, the, the governments to mm -hmm. be able to deliver on the expectations of the citizens, yes. the assemblies are not doing well. So in finishing, we must therefore look at how we build the capacity of the members, the county assembly members. Some of them cannot debate. Some of them do not understand the budget process. Some of them do not understand the legislative process. Whereas on the, the other side, we have governors who are professors, like Makweni is a professor. How do you therefore sit with somebody who does not understand the book information and the practice knowledge and keeps demanding thank certain you. things which are supposed to be you delivered right, to thank them? You. Dibal, right. I love what Briefly, he... because you're, uh, we're, we're pinched yeah. for time. Yeah, you can I, interject. I, I just love what he has said about the fact that we need to have thank uh, you for loving something I've performance said. <laughs> management of the county assemblies and how many laws have they passed. Yeah. He sat here for a while talking about the failures of governors not being able to pass certain laws for us to be able to have revenues to assist with our administration work. <laughs> now, if the county assemblies are failing on that, why are you putting it on the governors? No, no, no but on so source revenue. That, that is the failure. Really painted himself oh, in a corner. Yes, right? No, 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 no. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> these, these are so two things. So that's your own yeah. medicine. These oh. are two things. The first issue is an on-source revenue. The constitution refers to the county governor as the CEO. When the company is failing, you don't go to, you don't throw the back to the person who sits at the reception. When it comes to laws and the constitution, Thank you. Thank you. and the constitution has given the assemblies three responsibilities, representation, legislation and oversight. Fantastic. It is the role of the legislators to pass legislation. Right. It is the role of the governors to ensure that on source revenue is affected in the counties. Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> you know, I, I'm really stuck for time, but I, I'll be remiss if I don't really ask this uh, question because I think this has been also a very um, heated argument in the public uh, uh, forum as well. You know, public participation. And I wonder how effective it has been from the county level because people are saying, you know, we're not really involved in the decision uh, making of what is happening within our counties. And so far, you always make these announcements in the newspapers. Some of us, we don't access the newspapers, we don't read newspapers. Do you think this, this, there can be a discernible difference on how you are affecting the public participation process itself with the citizen engagement? Because I think that one is failing dismally. My opinion of public participation is that it is a very sore point for all county governments and it is one that needs to be intentionally uh, carried out for it to have any form of impact. And in some places you might find that people are saying that they're holding meetings just to rubber stamp them. In some places the challenge has been that are the citizens actually reading the necessary laws, documents, mm -hmm. even newspapers to be able to engage appropriately. In some places there's an expectation of Nitali Puanini, what will I be paid to be able to go for a meeting? That then extends the the budgetary expenditure, which may not necessarily exist because we have to have planning for how we're spending our money on actual development projects, not on facilitating you to come to a meeting to agree or not to but agree that's with the project. But that's maybe a poor civic education on what you know this particular pu public participation it, is all about. It's a, it's a, case, it's a case of point monetarily. of poverty, not necessarily of civic education. Okay. We live in very poor areas where being able to spend two or three hours away from your cow that is generating and feeding its grass, you will say, I need to have some kind of cost benefit to this, right? So you will expect okay. some little um, token on... So, but, but just to, to get back, we have gotten to a point where, in some cases, the citizenry is a lot more educated on what it needs to be engaging with the government mm -hmm. to prioritize the development projects that will then come in for their benefit. Prior to that, it used to be that this is it's being forced on you. There's a bit more say now, and in counties that have been able to um, enact this, our county being one of them, Makweni, West Pokot, um, was in issue. There's a number of them that have been able to engage with the citizen in a manner that is a journey. We're walking the journey and not necessarily telling them that this is what needs to be happening. Right.
Thank you so much. Uh, just a rejoinder from you, then we wind up. There's a lot of not really covered, but thank you yeah. nonetheless for coming. Uh, public participation is a national value. If you look at uh, Article 10, uh, rather, yeah, Article 10, Chapter 6, one of the nine principles of devolution is public participation. Our county governments have not done well to ensure that, that the citizens are participating. And if you look at uh, the County Governments Act, Section 100 of that Act mandates counties to put in place measures. And some of these measures are actually ensuring that the two hours of this uh, citizen who is being taken away from his or her, you know, daily wage or whatever, is covered. And that covering is through the budget process. If governors don't think that citizens are supposed to uh, participate, mm -hmm. we will not have them putting those kind of budget lines in the budgets. Because county assemblies then will pass budgets that do not have, uh, you know, uh, Alliance to ensure that citizens are being facilitated to be engaged in public participation processes. And that is why the BAL, we see county governments putting in place projects that are not citizen focused. You know, mm -hmm. in some places, citizens say we are called for those meetings, we make our, our voices heard, we make recommendations, but nothing is ever done. Sometimes they say they come with big bulky doc, uh, documents which nobody cares to break down to these citizens. In some parts of this country, people cannot speak in proper English, let alone just listening to hear what you are saying. If governors do not consider public participation as a basic minimum requirement for their success in devolution, they will continue to fail. Thank and you. it is only up to recently that we had almost all the 47 counties now passing uh, the Public Participation Act, which is also a responsibility of, of counties. Fantastic. Because through that, then you have thresholds of how citizens are, are supposed to participate and also ensuring that you organize them into sector working groups so that those who have interest in agriculture are organized around agriculture. Fantastic. Those who have interest in education participate around education. But we don't see effective measures by county governments through those kind of channels to ensure that citizens are participating. You're a software engineer. You know, also from that particular aspect, how you should have organized maybe a hub, you know, a Silicon Valley within the Taita Tiveta. I don't know, maybe something yeah. is happening on the ground. Yeah, precisely. Uh, Majala would be able to tell us. But finally, just 30 seconds, because we're winding up, we're uh, strapped for time. Just 30 seconds, your headline thoughts. Um, devolution is a journey, and it is a journey that we all need to be engaged in from the very top levels of the president to the bottom levels of the youth, just getting their ID, trying to figure out how they can um, actively participate in democracy, which is what our country is currently. Um, we need to ensure that everyone is carrying out the responsibilities as required, and we need to ensure that the, the public especially is empowered to know that they're the ones who hold the strength. Not the elite, not the politicians, not the 10% that seems to be making a lot of noise on these forums, for example, mm -hmm. or um, in the media. We need to have the power go back right to the grassroots. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kevin, you 30 seconds. Devolution is the uh, cornerstone of our sustainable development. It is incumbent upon governors and the county governments to put in place measures mm -hmm. to ensure that citizens' voices are heard and that resources are equitably and judiciously used. Uh, we must stop the theft of uh, public resources and corruption that we are seeing in counties, because ultimately you are a governor for, if you are lucky, 10 years, five for each of the uh, single terms. After that, what do you do? Do you want to form a regional government so that who uh, gives you the mandate? Do you want to keep bothering people uh, to pay for your health insurance when you fail to put in place measures to ensure that uh, health is, sus is sustainable? Thank you. So we have effective measures. Let's do what we are required to do, and uh, the sky will be the, li the limit. So, uh, yeah, governorship, a private fiefdom, or a servant leadership? The ideal scenario is supposed to be servant leadership. What we have is fifth domship. A one-liner. What we have now is a fifth domship. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's hear from uh, Majala as well. It's uh, I know, of course, the answer before it's you. It's definitely <laughs> seven <laughs> It's definitely seven Fantastic. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this uh, cogent, uh, uh, insightful conversation we've had, of course. And uh, thank you for graciously consenting to be part of, uh, you know, Siasa Bomba, our first installment. I really thank you so much. Yes, uh, it's still a private fiefdom, right? It's servant leadership. Yes. We'll leave it at that so much. It's up to maybe our audience, maybe. 
to also make the assessment as well. But I want to thank you nonetheless also for joining us this uh, first installment of CSL Bomba, where we're looking at the role of governors in devolved Kenya. Is it a private fiefdom or a servant leadership? And I think from the cogent discussion that we've had, well, you can make your own assessment. Thank you so much. My name is Dibala Nair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>